Welcome to another Sunday morning rant with yours truly. Well, actually, it's Sunday afternoon. You always catch me out. Um, this morning I went into something silly called body pump. Um, tomorrow I am definitely going to hurt. Um, but um, I was looking back at the video library um, a couple of days ago and realised I hadn't actually done this for about a month. And I do apologise for that. Because I did try to do, I do try to do this every week, but I haven't done it for a month. And there's a couple of reasons why I haven't. One of the biggest reasons is the fact that I do all my editing on my Mac, and my Mac has been to Apple for repair. Um, it started doing some really weird things, and when I was away on a business trip, absolutely, absolutely gave up the ghost around about the um, beginning of July, which was a real problem for me because I was trying to use the damn thing at the time. Um, so it's gone that it went to apple apple said it needed a brand new logic board which they did actually do for free be fair to them but i was just quite surprised that a three less than three year old computer uh actually needed a new logic board hey ho it's fixed now it's working seems to be doing what it was meant to be doing fingers crossed touch wood um moving forward um i've also did take a couple of weeks off um, because of other stuff that's going on in my life which I sort of allude to on, from time to time on the channel uh, unfortunately it's, it's starting to sort of get to that nasty stage uh, of my divorce uh, where I have to spend a lot of time researching and producing information for the barristers and solicitors not a particularly fun thing to do but it does take a lot of time it takes time away from my time in the studio uh, and my time playing with my keyboards and other instruments so we are where we are. So what I thought is for the first rant back, I'd actually pick up a bunch of questions that have been on the channel. So loads of people have been writing into the channel, asking questions about various pieces, bits and bobs that I've mentioned on the channel from time to time. Um, and I thought, well, I'd use this as another one of those sessions where I just whiz through some of these questions and give you my spin on them. Um, before I do that, what do you think of the T-shirt? It's quite cool, isn't it? Now this was um, a photograph that was actually on the channel uh, about two months ago. Now it was uh, basically I had a load of my D-series synths in a studio uh, when I had my camera out. Um, so basically, we, you know, my friend took a load of photographs of the of the the D-series synths in various guises. This is one of the better ones that came out, and had it made up into a T-shirt. I think it looks quite cool. Not quite sure I'd wear it down the sort of disco, but hey ho, mind you, having said that, wear it down the disco it really gives you an idea of how old I am, doesn't it? Um, anyway, I'm going to start with the questions. I feel like Trevor McDonough. Does anyone remember that? You have to be sort of British, I suppose, and, and of a certain age to remember Trevor McDonough. Uh, news at 10, Trevor McDonough. Um, anyway, I'm carry on being serious. Oh, I can't be serious. So the first question was from 12 Wing Productions. And the question was, can the PG-1000 be used to control parameters on other Roland products, like the Integra 7, or is it dedicated to the D50 only? Well, number one, it's not dedicated to the D50. It's actually dedicated to the D50 and the D550. Um, so both of those products um, are, de are designed to be operated with this PG-1000. 1000 so I went and raided this from the studio this morning on my way back from the gym um, the um, it came out a year after the D50 I believe because it didn't come out at the same time as the D50 it was a, a there was a slight lag before this sort of arrived uh, and it was obviously designed to work with both those units the the, the rack mount and the and the keyboard itself um, now, what the there is a reply on here that said it, it only talks SysX, which is true. It does only talk SysX, um, but it talks real-time SysX, which is sort of you know what we'd expect to um, be able to push down from a, a sequence or something. This does exactly the same. It, it, it basically talks to all the parameters associated with the live patch in real time. So as you move the faders up and down, effectively it's making those changes real time to the to the actual keyboard or the D550, depending on which, which one you've got it plugged into. And it's incredibly powerful and incredibly easy to use. And it's a shame that a, a number of 
other manufacturers never really went down that route with their with their keyboards and, and insisted that you sat and tried to program it through the interface on the on the keyboard itself. Um, and I think this is probably one of the reasons why the D50 was around for so long because of the flexibility introduced by this sort of tool. Now you can get this tool in a in like a plug-in or a VST. Um, but I'm I'm sort of sorry, I like the tactile nature of, of actually having the tool there. Now going back to when these keyboards were coming out, they Roland seemed to produce a dedicated programmer for pretty much every set of keyboards that was coming out. So you had this one, which is obviously the PG-1000, there you go, which was the one for the D50 and D550. Then um, you had this one here, and I don't think I've ever I've had this on camera before, but this is the actual programmer for the D10, the D20, and the D and the U D one was it D one one O? I think it might be the D one one O. I've never used it with the D one one O, but I think it is the D one one O as well. Um, and that's that programmer. Now, what's really interesting is if I put that there, you can see that, is you can actually use that to program some of the parameters on the D50. And funny enough, you can use that to program some of the parameters on the D10 and D20. I know, because I've done it. It is a bit hit and miss though. So, you know, bear that in mind, it is a bit hit and miss in the way that it operated. But you can do it. What you can't do is you can't use this really to control um, parameters on a newer synth because the newer synths are expecting um, the parameters to be coming up through USB uh, and they're designed to work that way. So trying to sort of send stuff up and down the, the, the SysX would really be hit and miss. I dare say that if you did try it on, on a newer synth, you would get some results. But you've got to remember that this is sort of designed to give certain channels and certain commands um, and the synthesizer you're targeting at may interpret those commands in a different way to the way the Roland D50 interprets those commands so you get some really interesting stuff going on. Anyway, I hope that answers that question for you. The second question is one of my favourites and it always comes back and back um, about the TR8. Now, Again, I raided the studio this morning. I got the TR8 out so I could show you this. So, the question is, this might be a stupid question, but this is the first time for me to get into live performance stuff. If I connect my monitors to the TR8 after I've, after I've midis are all connected, will I still get sound from the System 1 and TV3? No. MIDI does not carry the audio between the RE units, right? End of story, does not work. The MIDI is there it, to be in truth on these units to allow it to work with legacy legacy keyboards, etc. i.e. to have a clock signal being sent or something like that. It's not really there um, to do very much more than that on these units. These units have a USB and they are designed really to either go to a computer with an audio interface and the audio comes out through the computer or they're designed to work um, standalone i.e. each individually using the outputs on the unit itself or they're designed to work with the MX1 uh, Roland Mixer unit which comes as part of the ARIA suite okay so that's the reality now I've gone through this before, but if you look at the back of a, a TR8, you'll notice that you've got two master outputs there and then two external inputs down here somewhere there. I've got my fingers over them there. So if you wanted to use this as a standalone unit, as in coming out of the masters, you'd have a left and right feed going off to the mixing desk of the venue you're in or wherever it happens to be then you could use the mono feeds on the System 1 and the TB3 to go in left and right on here and therefore they would come out of the left and right channels in here in the final mix. Okay, so if you were using a bass on the System 1 and you were using um, the bass line on the, or 
sorry, probably probably more better idea to use a lead on the system one and a baseline on the DB3, then you could you, these will be coming out individual tracks on here. If you were going to use that, you would then need to go into the system setup of this, I would suggest, and reassign the drums or the drum sounds to the A and B channels. Okay, that way you would then get um, or left and right. Sorry, go into here and do it left and right would be more more what I'm trying to say there. That way you end up when you're pumping the left or the right up, you know that you're pumping the lead and say. I don't know, toms and hi-hats up. And on the other side, you've got the bass and the bass drums and the snare, maybe. I don't know which way around you want to do it, but that's the way you would do it. So, hope that answers that question. I get, that, get asked that question quite a lot, and that really is, it can, seems to confuse a lot of people. All you've got to remember with the TR, with the ARIA series, is MIDI is pure MIDI. There is no audio involved in the MIDI stuff, all right? It's a bit confusing because if you go and look at the original promotional videos for the original ARIA set of set of equipment, which was the System One, the vocoder, uh, what was it, VB, VB One, uh, TB Three, and the TR Eight, it seems very confusing when you look at those four products in how you actually use them all together in one unit with a master mix coming out. And that's the reason I think a lot of people have been confused by thinking that the audio comes down the MIDI, which it doesn't, okay? So that's that one. Then we come on to a really interesting one. Um, and this was, by the way, the last one was raised by Dean Ferns. I didn't say that, so there you go. Dean, I hope that's answered your question. Um, now, I'm probably gonna pronounce your name wrong here. So Gosha Verin. Um, the question is, hello, I cannot edit the volume in the user banks, although I send MIDI messages about changes in volume or velocity at the same time with the factory banks. All the volume is edited well. What's the problem? God knows. <laughs> and I'm being brutally honest here. Um, the, um, the FBO1, the TX81Z, the DX7, are an utter nightmare to to manage if you manage to move a parameter you didn't expect to move okay um, I'm sure that people who followed um, me for a period of time know that I had a problem with my DX7 and it went on for weeks I was trying all kinds of things to try and sort the problem out and then one day it was fixed and to this day I cannot tell you how I fixed it really can't i can tell you the sort of things i was doing but i can't tell you how i fixed it because i have absolutely no idea so there are a couple of things probably i would i would start to look at with this one um the first question i'd asked is have you got memory protect on and it may seem a bit daft because you're not updating the patches in memory but it be, could be because on the user banks, the, sys, the FBO1 is seeing the, the SysX commands for volume uh, and aftertouch and velocity as parameter changes or, or patch changes. And therefore, if you've got the memory protect on it, it may be blocking them for that. Now, I can't be 100% sure because I've never run across this one myself. Um, and, and that's sort of... You know, me being honest, I've, I've never come across this one, so I can't reproduce your 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 issue. I'm just going through how my mind would work um, if I were in your shoes. Uh, the second thing I would try, um, if you've tried and checked that you haven't got the memory protect on or off, is I'd actually flash the user banks. And I know that sounds a bit draconian, but what I would do is I'd take all your patch sounds off the user banks, back them up using SysX, and then I'd flash them back to factory preset. And the reason why I would do that, and when you flash them back, make sure you flash back all the factory parameters. Um, and the reason for doing that is that you may have inadvertently changed something not realizing that what you were changing where you thought it was fairly innocent has 
actually caused the machine to stop or ignore a bunch of uh, commands that you are sending it during your performance or in performance mode. And as I said to you before, it can be the most innocent parameter on these boxes that will really, really, really catch you out. Um, and so, as I say, what I would do is probably flash it back to factory. Once you've flashed it back to factory, reload your patches back onto the box, and that may clear it for you. Um, if it's not that, then I probably would need some more flesh on the bone before I can actually start helping you diagnose where the issue is. Um, because this, you know, as I say, a lot of this stuff, especially on the old Yamaha stuff, is really, really hit and miss. It's not a case of this is what's causing your problem. It could be a combination of parameters you have set or changed that are causing it to not read that block of sysx or that block of commands. So not quite the answer you're after, but hopefully that's pointed you in the right direction when you go and actually start your investigation. Yes, these old units are fantastic, and I ha I am I, I hold great store in old units. Um, but when they go wrong, they are complete nightmares. So you really need to have your wits about you, and you need to be really, really patient as well can't say that enough you really have to be patient because this stuff can wind you up big time do, 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 do. right so i'm going to move on to the next one this one comes from uh, botany 500 um, and it says i have a handful of gear with japanese voltage i would like to see the process of converting them to 220 volts for use in the uk have you ever done this without buying broken a broken one and taking the relevant parts out like this video? Yes, I have. Um, I think what you need to understand is um, whether you can get a broken one cheap enough. So um, there are a number of ways of doing this, and I've done it a number of ways in the past. Okay, so the first thing I would try and do is I would try and get hold of the service manuals, okay? So this is the service manual for the Roland G20. And the reason I say you need to get hold of the service manual is because quite often in the service manual, it has diagrams like such, okay? That breaks down the keyboard or the unit you're looking at into its component parts and also tells you what each part is from the Roland catalog. Right? You may therefore be able to do a Google search for the part you are after and find that it is actually on a shelf somewhere. Now, Roland do carry quite a lot of legacy parts. I know that because I have bought Roland, part, Roland legacy parts. But their supply is dwindling, okay? So they may have had X amount of spare transformers, capacitors, whatever it happens to be. But the beauty of this, um, by buying this, is it actually tells you what goes where um, and how it's put together so if you go and look here you've got things like block diagrams which tell you how in this case this is the block diagram for the main board okay it also tells you the uh, can tell you how to test the keyboard what the test sequences are um, but more importantly, quite often in the service manual, when you get down to the end of the service manual, dun 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 dun, here we go. So this is the back of the service manual. Okay. Uh, what am I looking for here? Is that one? Haha. <laughs> This one. What it does is it gives you 
to apologise because this is a wee fiddly to get this up. But I don't know where you can see that. Whether that's coming across on camera okay. But that is the circuit diagram for the power supply in this particular unit. All right. If you can get hold of this documentation, like I tend to carry, and the reason why I have had got hold of all this information is because quite often when I have to repair stuff, this is where I get the information from. Um, it gives you, that's the power supply board. What's even better about that is actually if you took a, um, if you took this to somebody who knew what they were doing, they would actually be able to reproduce a power supply board for you with all the right holes and all the right connectors in it. Okay, because this is effectively is the blueprint for the power supply board. And then what they would be able to do is they will be able to read on here, which tells you all the different settings and all the different components and the resistances, etc. And you could actually rebuild the power supply board with the modern day equivalent components for a 220 volt power supply. Now that may seem like a lot of work and it probably is a lot of work, but that's how you do it properly. The, the other thing that I've done, as, as I said, so I've bought um, old equipment in the past that's been sold as, as not working um, and I've cannibalized it. Uh, and I make no bones about that. I don't like cannibalizing the keyboards, but if the keyboard or the um, rack mount unit is beyond repair and some of these keyboards have been treated abysmally, so the actual keyboard itself, the key bed is shot to bits and the case is shot to bits, but actually the internal circuitry tends to be fairly okay. So you can move it from one machine to another. Um, and because the aesthetics of the keyboard itself or the unit itself are absolutely appalling, you'll pick those up relatively cheap. Um, the other thing I've done is looked around on eBay, so either put the part number in of the circuit board, so the circuit board itself completely built will have a part number, I've put that part number into eBay and to another other, a number of search engines and you find people who are actually selling the components rather than selling the um, the keyboard itself. So they've already done the cannibalization for you. All you're doing is buying the relevant um, piece uh, and you can pick those up. And that's funny enough, that's what I've done with the T1. Um, with the T1 because uh, a number of bits on the T1 were failing. Uh, what I did was I just did a search on the internet, found people who were actually selling those components from a broken down T series synthesizer, and I bought those units. And it cost me, you know, ten dollars, twenty dollars. I think the most expensive bit was about seventeen dollars, and it cost me about five dollars to ship. So, you know, there are ways around doing this. Um, so that's the second one. The third one is, and and what I'm also uh, should point out here is high-end synthesizers so typically stuff that when was brand new was over 500 quid I would have said um, probably over sort of seven seven fifty eight hundred dollars would typically have a separate power supply in the unit itself okay um, and that's generally how the manufacturers did it because what the manufacturers did is they basically built a synthesizer for all regions and then when they came to ship that synthesizer, they effectively put in the appropriate power supply and voltage gubbins as it came in. So typically on a US um, supply keyboard, you'll only see two pins. Um, whereas on a European supply keyboard, you'll always see three pins because we have the earth um, uh, standards in Europe. So you know you can you can change those relatively easily. I mean I've done that with my D5 with my D550. That was a US spec. Um, I bought it in the US and brought it back with me. Um, and when I got it home, I literally just changed. I come on to why I actually changed on it, but the actual voltage um, connector go in, and I just took out the American one and put in a UK one. It's exactly the same size. Um, or the European one, exactly the same size as is the Japanese one. It's exactly the same size for the actual connector. It's just a different cable. Um, and popped it in. 
So that's on typically on the high end stuff. Now the third thing you might get lucky with, and especially you'll find this in Roland equipment, is Roland actually put a universal transformer into their equipment. So if you go actually and look at the transformer itself, it will actually say, um, this is the connection, this is the, the, the zero connection, as in zero volts. This is the connection for a 110 supp 100 volt supply, a 110 volt supply, a 220 volt supply, and a 240 volt supply. Now, most equipment will work fine on a 240 volt supply if you have it connected at 220, okay? As long as you've got it correctly fused. However, um, don't uh, don't take that for granted. Do do check that before. But most most transformers are tolerant enough for that, uh, especially if you put everything you know on a, on a some sort of smoothed power supply like I have run in the studio, and I've done things about um, power distribution units and and batteries and stuff like that in the past. So, you know, if you've got that sort of stuff working where you haven't where you've got nice smooth um, 60 or 50 hertz sine wave coming out of your 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 power supply then you shouldn't have any issues with that at all where you might have an issue is where you have a very dirty supply and lots of spikes going on in the supply because that can then damage things um, so yeah on on the Roland stuff you can you can quite easily just unsolder and resolder the mains voltage coming into the um, transformer from the power switch and that is if you go and open up the D-series synthesizers, the U-series synthesizers, and all the um, uh, equipment that came around that era from those synthesizers, all those synthesizers work that way. They have a universal transformer in them, and you can just swap voltages and then pop out the, the power supply and put the correct power uh, molding in for your particular region. The, the, uh, the final way of, of looking at this is if you've got a power supply that is mounted on the board. Now this would be typically the cheaper way of doing it um, in terms of the manufacturers just wanted, wants to put one board in the, in the piece of equipment itself and therefore they mount the transformer to that. Now there are a couple of ways of dealing with that. If you look at the, the way the transformer is mounted and you can see a direct connection without very much messing around between the on-off switch, probably through a fuse of some description, um, and then onto a transformer, it could be easy to actually get hold of a transformer of the same um, voltage and actually put that into the machine. Now it might not fit exactly where you've got that transformer on the board, but you might be able to jury rig something, as in mount the transformer on another board to the case in somewhere, and, and that would allow it to happen. Now, it's not something I would recommend, um, if I'm honest. Um, if you're in that sort of scenario, I probably wouldn't buy the equipment, um, because I prefer to have all my equipment in the studio running 240 volts, um, not running uh, other voltages. So that's the first thing you could do there. If you were going to go down that route, you would have to look very, very closely about at the um, what is in between the mains coming into the unit and going into the transformer. Because typically, I would suspect you will have to change the fuse if there's a fuse, an inline fuse, because that's expecting 110, 100 volts at whatever ampage to come in to meet the power requirements of the unit and as we all know that sort of, of power is voltage times amps so if you've got a hundred if you're if you've got a if you want to have a hundred watts of power on your unit i'll have to do this then the very simple maths is to get a hundred volt hundred watts of power at a hundred volts at v times a a must be one amp, one amp so that fuse will be set at one amp when you come to 240 volts, to get 100 watts of power, you effectively only need a third of an amp. And that fuse would need to be downed to a third of an amp, not an amp. Hopefully that makes sense. Hopefully it's not too much technical jargon. Now what I have done in the past is I've actually had, few, I've had power boards built. There is a company not far from where I live. Um, they do proof of concept. PCBs, 
if I take down the um, the service manual with the board design on it, what they do is they photocopy it, they then run it through a computer program they've got for designing and building this stuff. Um, they can then pretty much knock out an etched PCB in a few days. And then it comes back to me pre-drilled with all the holes in the right places. And then all I have to do is go and get the relevant component parts from Maplin or RS Components. And I can rebuild that, pro that, that, that board with a, a modern day transformer on it. So there are your options. Um, hopefully that sounds okay. It's, uh, it does get a little bit technical, but that's, that's the way I typically would do that. Right, uh, blah, 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 blah. so I think it's time for one more on this one. And um, maybe I'll leave the next ones for next week. So, last one on this comes from, um, da, 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 where are we going? Blip, bloop. Do you know what, some of you guys got fantastic names. Um, and he said, where can I find the file update for the System 8? Very, very simple, this one. Um, and I, I would always go to the Roland.com website, first of all, when you're trying to update Roland gear, um, because I always find that the Roland UK website sometimes doesn't work properly. The Roland.com one works all the time. Uh, I think it's some sort of time and difference when they do updates, that the updates takes a while to filter to the UK site. I'm not 100% sure whether it must be hosted in a different area or on a different server farm or something. Um, anyway, go to the Roland.com website, navigate yourself to the area equipment page, find the System 8, go to that page, and then you'll find a list of options just under the picture of the System 8 itself. Look for the one that says Downloads. It will then present you with a download page, and you should be able to find the latest version of firmware there. Now, bear in mind, I haven't updated my System 8 to 1.12. Um, I think I've, I've got 1.11 on mine at the moment. Um, so I will be updating mine soon. But the video in question was for 1.11, and you now need to update it to 1.12. But it's in the same place. You go to the same place, download it, and away you go. There you go. Hopefully, that's five questions answered five questions move forward <laughs> um, I do actually enjoy reading the questions that you send through um, some of them are a little bit challenging uh, some of them are downright rude um, uh, so you know some of them do get ignored I will admit to that um, but if you're if you're if you're genuinely stuck on something and if I can help you out then I will respond to your question either do it this way or with all the these I've actually responded directly to you um, and said, this is how I think you should do this. Other than that, I have now rambled on for about 30 odd minutes, maybe, 30, maybe a few more than 30 minutes, which is normally the top whack, top whack of my uh, ramblings on a Sunday for this sort of stuff. So I'm gonna leave you uh, to enjoy the rest of your Sunday evening, because it is now getting close to Sunday evening. The sun, it feels like the sun's going down. As you can see, I'm doing this from my my front room, as they say, which overlooks the garden and clobbers the windows as he does it. Anyway, I hope everything is well with all you guys, uh, all those of you who uh, watch this, and I shall talk to you very soon. Very soon? Very soon. Bye-bye. Take care. I've been told it helps the channel out greatly if you hit the like button if you enjoyed the contents of this video. If you want to be notified about future videos that may be made for the channel, please hit the subscribe button.